We're here live with Stefan. St Stephen? Stefan? Stefan? What? I don't even, I'm not even sure. Stefan is good. Stefan is good. Stefan. Okay. Um, here we go. Stefan, thanks a lot for uh, connecting. Again, we haven't seen each other for a long, long time. It's been How have you been? A year and a bit. I think something like that. Yeah, it's been cra crazy. I think it's probably the best word. <laughs> uh, intense. What? A um, lot of changes. What happened? What did I miss? What happened? Well, um, last time we, we saw each other, um, I was probably more able to actually hang out with you physically. And we were in Sydney together. Um, but then yeah. I decided to uproot my life again <laughs> and um, move to Sweden of four places um, during COVID, which was a, a unique move, maybe <laughs> a bit different. Um, and yeah, sort of just ended up here now living in Stockholm, did some travel, tried to maintain sanity during quite an interesting time here in Europe, as I'm sure you can imagine. Uh, you're a um, Spotify product manager, right? How, how does That's that, right. how does that, uh, like, how, how has your job been affected by, because in, in, in Australia, we're not actually experiencing much COVID, luckily uh, enough, but how has your job been affected by um, the uh, pandemic? Yeah, um, a lot, I think is the answer. Uh, in short, um, the longer answer is, it has relative, you know, quite completely transformed how I work, right. So um, Spotify has been remote, since I joined in June of 2020. So almost one year ago now. Um, so I've actually never worked from the office. <laughs> I have only met my colleagues in real life maybe once or twice. So it's a very different way of working. Uh, you know, if I think back two or three years, you know, when we were together in Sydney, you know, I was I was working in the office every day. I spent a lot of time in the office. Like my job there, you know, I, I liked being at the office. It was a different um, uh, different job though. You were working for uh, for Google. Is there any difference? Like, uh, what's your experience like? Like uh, working for Google and working for Spotify. What, what are the key differences that you can notice? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think there are not actually that many differences. <laughs> so, you know, these are both large tech companies, one being much larger than the other. Obviously, Google is, is much larger. Uh, but there are still a lot of similarities in the kind of culture that um, exists within these companies. So sort of the, the engineering culture that perm permeate, perm uh, like permeates throughout the, the company um and and also maybe you know the kind of benefits that we get and also the kind of work that we do right For, like when you're working in technology and, and myself as a product manager um the way in which we build software basically to meet user needs it's not actually that different um the product obviously is very different but the product is is almost just like whatever is in frame at the moment you know i think as a whole it didn't feel like a huge cultural shift moving from Google to Spotify. Maybe a little bit, it, you know, it's still a little bit more startup kind of culture at, at Spotify. Um, I think we have, you know, 6,000 employees, roughly, maybe slightly more. Well, Google has, you know, well in excess of 100,000 now. So the, the, the order of magnitude is a little different, but the culture is actually not that different. Um, you mentioned startups. Um, well, Spotify is, I mean, uh n not n not a startup but it, it, i i understand the uh, comparison um i guess my question is you 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 mentioned to me um a couple of times that um eventually you might be interested in actually uh, working on a startup project from the uh, very beginning or uh, becoming a digital nomad uh which technically you you, you are already right um kind of yeah <laughs> i mean the 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 element of of working remotely is very unique uh, it's it's certainly something that opens almost a scary amount of possibilities uh, I, I and i've been having this conversation with a lot of my colleagues you know we we are now really 
free. <laughs> you know, we're not bound to anywhere. Um, I will get to your a question about startups in a second, but maybe I can just elaborate a bit on this whole like digital nomad thing. Because yes, I know that's kind of hot right now. So, you know, Spotify has this concept called work from anywhere, um, which is this idea that we can theoretically choose a place to live and then stay there. But it doesn't have to be any specific, you know, place. So I could say I could, for example, move to anywhere where Spotify has like a legal entity, a legal entity being like a, a way that they can pay me, right? A place that they pay taxes in. So the limitations are really only bureaucratic, which I expect to change at some point. But, you know, if I wanted to move to the Canary Islands in Spain, or if I wanted to move to, I don't know, French Guinea, you know, I could do that. Uh, and a lot of people are doing that. You know, there are, I'm at work, I'll be on a, you know, a call and I'll be like, oh, it's an interesting, you know, where are you? And he's like, oh, I'm in Tunisia. Okay. That's like, this is the kind of thing that's happening now. People have realized that working in a distributed way is actually not particularly unproductive. Besides um, being super um, cool, how does that affect your productivity? Yeah, um, it's it just changes the focus times, I think, because like my barrier to, you know, going to the kitchen and making lunch is like, you know, two seconds. <laughs> so it just makes it a lot easier to theoretically be distracted from your work. This is definitely true. But I think what that results in, you know, for me, I'm quite passionate about what I do here and, and same at Google, like when we were working remotely, I still want to put in the time because I believe in what I'm building. And so I, it just means that I might work more flexibly. You know, maybe I wake up later, maybe I wake up at like nine o'clock, then I'll, you know, I'll start working at 9.30 or whatever, you know, and then maybe I'll work later, you know, and maybe I take a two hour lunch break, but then I work like a little later into the evening. It just means that like no one really cares what I do as long as I get like, if I, as long as I build products that make Spotify money or, or improve the user experience. Absolutely. So this is um, the reason it, why. Yeah, tell me, tell me. I was just going to say like the productivity, I don't think has been affected massively by, by working distributed, at least at Spotify. Uh, actually, possibly positively. Because yeah, that, people are commuting less. That was my question. Like, do you think that it affects the productivity in a positive way? I think it, I think it has in some cases. It's very individual. You know, there are people on my team who you would commute up to an hour a day to get to the office. Stockholm has very high rent prices. <laughs> um, and so we see that people are more happy in many, in many cases. It, it's very split, you know. Some people who have, you know, families or would commute a long way, they are overjoyed by the idea that they can work from home indefinitely. Um, whereas it, there are also people, mm, myself maybe included, who would argue that um, we having not having access to the office is also a detriment, right? And to remove some of the collaborative aspects. So my, so my personal plan is to go to the office when it's open again, um, which might be a while, um, maybe once or twice a week, just to like sync with the team and, and feel like I'm part of a company. Because that's, that's one thing that's very difficult is, you know, I don't really have a lot of proof that I work at Spotify. I mean, I sit on a computer every day and I like, you know, I look at the camera and I'm in the meetings and like theoretically, you know, I, I get paid <laughs> and I have some swag, but like, I don't go to the office, you know, I don't have a badge, you know, I, I like this, these things have, have, have changed massively. I, I would expect you had a badge, you just didn't use it, but you don't have it at all. <laughs> No, I mean, they're not issuing them because no one's allowed to go to the office. Like that doesn't... Oh, makes sense. Yeah. Um, but it's quite, it's, it, it's a very big change. I think um, in my case, um, in my experience, I, I don't like working for a company because in the past, at least, like um, I, I need my freedom and I need to, to be more productive. I need to be able to manage my time in the most efficient way. Uh, I do find uh, beneficial uh, being surrounded by a team. So if I, if I think I like to have the option, uh, whatever I do, um, 
I try to build strong teams and and have like I, I need the cooperation and collaboration between like all the um, team members. But at the same time, I think, uh, as you said, it's very um, it comes down to the individual. Some people are more efficient if they can manage their time on their own, and this generally not always, but most of the times um, happens with more uh, like management roles and um, operations uh, are more like. We need to be part of a team. We need to confront each other. We need to to compare. We need to um, bounce ideas. So they generally w work better if they go to an actual uh, physical place. And also having a routine in place, in my experience, is something that helps a lot. Um, the I think the key is responsibility. Like the less responsibility you want to have, the, the less creative you are in your job and the more efficient you want to be, then routine is what helps you most. But as soon mm -hmm. as you are like in charge and you need to come up with creative solutions or you are creative in general uh, or you need to manage people, then those kind of people, they benefit more from like um, freedom in the sense of time and they perform much better when there is no strict schedule. This is this is what um, I can grasp from my experience. But again, it's totally. I would agree with you. Comes down to the individual. Yeah, I would definitely agree with you. Uh, I would say that um, uh, because my job involves ensuring the productivity of others as well as myself. You know, I like I do. Um, like I'm a manager for a team of of I guess we will be six five right now. Okay. And so it's, you know, for me to feel like I can be creative, you know, I, I need to have a little bit of flexibility. I, I don't need any, I, I can't be really managed by other people, if that makes sense. Totally. And that's kind of why I chose this role of product manager, because that is basically, I think, as close to, uh, you know, a CEO as you can get without being a CEO in itself. You're the CEO of the product, basically. <laughs> of exactly, the specific, yeah, yeah, pretty much. I know that's a very that's a very cliche way of thinking about what product managers do. And it's not, you know, it, it sounds a lot more glamorous than, than it is. You know, often we are picking up the work that, you know, we have to do, right? There's a lot of stakeholder work. We have to work a lot with people. Sometimes there's a lot of discussion, there's, there's arguments, you know. So we're doing like so many different things. Which, which emulates this feeling that we get in a startup, right? Of being a, a founder or a CEO. So uh, coming back to your, your, you know, your question before around startups, um, my, my kind of idea is, you know, I'm, I'm gaining skills as a product manager in these kinds of large companies, right? Um, and I'm learning how to, you know, lead a team effectively and keep everyone motivated and like, you know, build products that affect hundreds of millions of people. And then my plan is to apply that. Um, and, and this is very candid, you know, everyone knows this, my manager knows this, um, that I want to apply these skills that I learn, you know, in, in the next couple of years to starting my own company, ideally one that is like environmentally focused um, and, and climate change focused, That's which brilliant. is a, an issue that I, I, I hold dear to my heart, shall we say. Do you know what your company is going to focus on specifically? You already have an idea for a startup or a problem that you want to solve? Um, yes. <laughs> I think it gets complicated. I, I have many, many different ideas. Um, there, is, there is one particular idea that I think I will attack first. But I think if I, if, I, if I stick to a few different industries, I think it would be either transportation, um, I would say consumer purchases, right? So like buying and selling things. Okay. Um, and, and maybe the third being, um, I would say energy as well. Okay. So like, I think those are the three areas that I could be very disruptive. Um, oh, and the fourth, sorry, it would be uh, like the way we eat food, right? Okay. Like ideally moving people to more plant-based diets. But maybe oh, we can, you know, that, that could take up this whole podcast entirely. Maybe we can <laughs> focus on um, sort of where I'm thinking to start with. Absolutely. Um, so there, are, there, are, there is a startup that I'm sort of musing on. Um, it's considering the 
the job that I have. Um, I don't have a lot of free time, unfortunately, to to work on my own ideas. Um, Spotify is cool though; it, it allows us to do that as long as we, you know, we faithfully say that we're still working that you know the hours that they're paying us for, and we're not using, you know, Spotify resources, shall we say, to create those companies, yeah. which are not. It's a honor system. Um, yeah, I guess you know like, we're not micromanaged here, um, and and yeah, coming back. So the startup idea kind of it it, it revolves around my idea of reducing the need for people to buy things unnecessarily, um, especially you know thinking brand new, right? Like in my mind, when you go to Amazon, uh, which is very convenient, you know, and you find an item you need and you have it free shipped to your house, the the climate impact of that purchase is quite significant right you know for for the item to be shipped from you know maybe a, a manufacturing country you know maybe china india indonesia something like that to a warehouse maybe you know for you guys in, in australia um, and then have it packaged again you know in plastic and then delivered to our house by a truck that uses diesel like that's an incredibly inefficient supply chain. Absolutely. Um, but it is very convenient, right? For the end consumer, that is great. You know, if you know, you know, you can't see the the, the emissions of your of your purchase there. Um, but I, I think the ironic thing is, you know, in a lot of cases, the thing that you are buying from Amazon is also something that someone nearby might want to sell that they're not using anymore. So you're talking second I, second hand. Yes, I think the the second hand world is massively underutilized and oh, and and has a lot of really poor quality you know people list their items on on you know I guess in Australia like Gumtree and Facebook marketplace but the way in which they do that is very flawed right because first of all they have to remember that they want to sell it which I think for many people is is a difficult right we have a house full of stuff a lot of it we don't use, but like we don't remember that we're not using it. And even if we do, it's a hassle to list it, right? Yeah, it's, it's a, a bummer. To take a picture, to write time. a description. And then like people will message you on Facebook Marketplace and be like, oh, you know, is it still available? <laughs> <laughs> when can I come pick it up? You know, it's like the, the process of, of selling something is a nightmare. Yeah, and they want bargains. Uh, they, they offer crazy exchanges like, oh, can I give you like uh, three eggs and a fork in exchange for a phone? Exactly. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, honestly, I've had lots of, there's, there's some great Facebook pages about like funny interactions on Facebook Marketplace. They're absolutely gold. You know, people, like for example, I was selling, um, I was selling uh, an old phone of mine and I wanted, like in Sweden, we use crowns, right? Um, as our currency. So I wanted um, 8,000 crowns for it. And someone offered me 800 and like, I don't like in that moment that that interaction is such a waste of my own time. It's such Absolutely. a poor user experience that like, you know, I think a lot of people are deterred from using these marketplaces because of this. I know I um, am. And, and <laughs> yeah, I, I completely, un, you know, completely understand. And so I think at the end of the day, um, the fact that people hate selling these, you know, hate the selling experience means that they don't sell things. And that lack of supply in the marketplace, right? Now we're speaking in economic sense. Um, that lack of supply is causing people to also not buy, right? Because you know that like there's probably not going to be on anything on Facebook marketplace within you know one square kilometer of you that meets your needs. But it it's not because there isn't actually something you know somewhere just not listed. in your neighborhood. It's just not listed exactly. And I think this is one of the biggest fundamental problems that, you know, the world actually has today. I, I, it, it seems small, but it's this massive underutilization of things. To right? me, to me, it doesn't sound small. Actually, it sounds like that there is huge potential for that if that can be solved. But I would have no clue how to solve that. <laughs> like, How would you make people, everyone, list their items on a different platform? And how would you protect the users and, 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 and make sure that they would have a uh, successful and, and enjoyable um, experience. Like, it's two problems that you need to solve. It is. Um, I least. do have some <laughs> solutions for those. 
that and that is that is the concept for my startup um, idea, uh, which is a very you know it's it's unformed to be very frank. Uh, and I love talking about this. You know, I, I think um, hopefully anyone who, who listens to this maybe you know they can reach out and, and I'd love to get any feedback on it. Absolutely. But I think if you want to. The, the question is not necessarily making everyone list their things on Facebook Marketplace, right? It's just, it's, it's starting to track the things that you buy and also tracking the status of the things that you own, right? So for example, like, let's say I buy a, I don't know, a sofa from Ikea. When I buy that sofa, the only person that knows that, like from an electronic perspective is ikea right i i personally don't have i maybe i have an email right in my inbox that says like you know thank you for your order right or maybe i have a like a paper receipt but that sofa is not like tracked within all of the things i own and so theoretically if you were able to keep track of all the things you buy I think I think you know where I'm going with this. I think I know I where you're going. Your yes. Face. Yeah. I think there is huge potential there. And I think uh I, okay, my question is, do you think the user should track their uh, their items directly or would it make more sense to have a platform that it is it, sort of like passive in the sense that like if you subscribe to that platform um you agree that the platform is going to track all of your purchase and that app itself can um remind you of what you have how old it is what's the market value and if you decide to sell it want to just it will take care of it automatically now you're just selling my idea back to me my friend <laughs> it's it's brilliant i i really like it yeah thanks so that's that's the general that's the general plan um obviously you know right now at spotify i'm i'm working on some relatively high impact projects um and you know it, it's it's going quite well so i you know i my plan is to stick around for a while um i like the company a lot and uh you know being in sweden is also quite unique <laughs> very different to sydney but yes, the ultimate plan is that I, I take this um, and I actually, to be very frank, I've already um, made a lot of steps. So we have a, a company name, it's called Minimist because we're aiming to be, you know, a little bit more minimalistic. Um, and, you know, I've, um, there, is, there is some code that is written. I've written it. <laughs> um, but uh, I guess, you know, um, I will ultimately look for a co-founder and um, attempt to create a bit of a revolution in, in this market because uh, I think the planet really cannot sustain the way we live our lives much longer. Um, there's, I don't know if you've been sort of looking at um, the sort of the news around this, but there are a lot of countries are now agreeing to very aggressive climate change targets, which, which will, if they want to meet them, require a very, very drastic change from today. Uh, not tomorrow, but from today. And so I would like to be part of that future. You I know? would say um, even uh, yesterday, think, maybe. <laughs> yes, unfortunately, time travel <laughs> doesn't exist. I mean, otherwise, I feel like we would all be doing things very differently. Maybe buying Bitcoin, right? Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, so that's that's the general plan, man. Um, I, Are I you guess into my, my crypto as well? Ethos, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, wow, that's another interesting one. I am... But I, I, I feel like, you know, as a relatively staunch, I will, I will call myself an environmentalist. Um, I think the, the hidden side of crypto is still on the same topic, um, is the environmental cost of it is very high. What um, sense? You know, sorry? In, um, in what sense? Right. So let's, if we compare like Visa, right, and MasterCard as like, the, should we say the incumbents, right? These are the companies that are processing the majority of transactions at the moment. Um, their, their, their transaction networks um, do, you know, 65, 70,000 transactions per second. Um, 
Bitcoin and Ethereum and you know other major coins are processing a very small fraction of the of that you know seventy thousand per second, more in the order of you know hundreds per second. Um, and in fact, to do that, the the entire decentralized network of miners, right? So the the computers that are being used to basically process these transactions in exchange for like a financial reward are using a ridiculous amount of electricity, like absolutely astronomical. I think it's in the terawattage oh, wow. region. I, I'm not sure hundred percent, but it, 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 it's, it's crazy. It's like Google data center level, you know, kind of stuff. Um, and, and for what, right? Like Bitcoin still hasn't particularly revolutionized the way any of us pay. I'm still, you know, I'm still using my visa, my visa credit card because it works fine. You know, I have Google Pay. Like paying for things is actually really easy uh, here in Sweden and in, and in Australia. So I think maybe the original goals of the these cryptocurrencies, it's not quite being lived up to, right? You know, we're we're more than 10 years down the track since since Bitcoin was released. Um, quite quite a bit more, right? And yeah. um, people are still not using it for actual transactions. They're using it as a store of wealth, like gold, but at the cost of, you know, a, a significant environmental cost. So I have, I have mixed feelings about it because, you know, I was, you know, in my, in my university years, I was very heavily involved with, with crypto, um, you know, working with friends and um, you know, my friend, he, he created a, a cryptocurrency investment bank almost, right? Now. And I, I worked with him on that and we were, you know, coins were the day, like day in day out, you know, I was trading the coins every day, um, made, you know, quite a significant amount of money at one point, and then lost it all the next day, as you do in, in these kinds of markets. Um, and, you know, it, it's very exciting. It's new, it's, it's novel, but I think the real big problem in the world right now is not like, you know, centralized payments, it's environmental devastation. <laughs> like, and I think that's, you know, obviously there's multiple facets of society that we feel should be, people should be working on. But I think a really important one is that our, our children are able to, uh, you know, breed. And I think that that's something I realized first. I know I'm going on a bit of a monologue here. So no, 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 no. Um, it's interesting because but, I never um, thought about know, it we in these both, terms. <laughs> we were both in Australia, um, you know, around the time of the fires, right? Like the really bad ones. Um, Oh sort yeah, yeah. In the start of 2020, end of 2019, right? Yeah, it was terrible. And like, it was that was the moment, you know, when when ash fell on my clothes outside, you know, in Piemont. Yeah. And I couldn't breathe. I, you know, I have these crazy videos, you know, of 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 the of the Google soccer team. We were playing in gas masks, you know, like we we wanted to play football I so have bad. No idea. But the air send me the videos. So like we. I will, I can. But in that moment, I realized that we are kind of screwed, right? Like there are some much, much stronger words I could use here, but we're, we're really like, I don't know. It's such a, it's kind of like, it feels like, it feels like an exam that's coming up or like homework that's due, you know, like it's coming. We know it's coming, but like we're procrastinating it. Uh, we're procrastinating doing our homework. We're procrastinating studying for the test. And, um, you know, I, I just get that kind of feeling that, you know, if we procrastinate until it's too late, then like there's nothing we can do anymore. And and I don't know what that means for, you know, my children. So that's that's kind of my that's that's what's on my mind. Um from a interesting. Absolutely interesting. I never I never thought about um I mean the environment is general it, it's absolutely like a very sensitive uh topic on so many levels. There's um a lot for of sure documentaries on netflix and people go crazy about uh what's the latest one sea spiracy fish spiracy whatever it's called i haven't watched i think sea spiracy i've heard of something like that yeah yeah um but <laughs> i don't know i heard so many crazy theories from both sides uh to the point that now i'm like I don't know. You get to the point where, like, the inform the amount of information is so much that you don't even know what, like, because also the evidence is not really out there. 
uh, you, you know what I mean? Like that we live in, in some sort of like uncertainty um, that make m- makes people confused. Uh, and I think mm-hmm. the main problem is education. I, I'm seeing that a lot with like COVID and, and a lot of people telling me like, oh, we don't need a vaccine. COVID is a scam. Like people are dying. What are you talking about? Like <laughs> how, how, how do you fix that? Ooh, the big questions. Um, I think, yeah, misinformation, like I, you know, I think the majority of people would agree is, is a very, very significant issue in today's society. I definitely agree with you. Fixing it. I think you could never fix it. I think you can reduce it, but misinformation has existed forever, right? It's just part of human nature. It's the way in which humans believe in things that aren't true, that has allowed society to prosper, but also obviously leads to the kind of crazy things that we see today, right? So I think we we have to accept that human beings are always going to be misinformed and try to misinform others. Yeah. I think the way the, the way in which you reduce it, I think it's about teaching people from a very early age to think incredibly critically about things that are, I'm going to say it in quite black and white terms, non-scientific, right? Like it's hard to find consensus in, in a world where, you know, you can say whatever, but if you can, if you can teach people to look at the facts, and the facts, if the facts are, are stored and marketed in a way that is relatively foolproof, which is the really difficult part, right? Um, I think you can make, you know, you can definitely change things here. But it's hard because, you know, one one person's fact is another man's lie, you know? So that's, yes. I mean, I, that's there the is no thing. ultimate uh, truth, I think. Like, I- even in science, we mm-hmm. discover new facts that change what, was like what used to be lived um to be true so like it, it's an organic process of evolution and ad- adaptation agreed it's it, yeah that's why that's why it's tricky like you cannot filter out information because something that is like it's false today might be true tomorrow and vice versa but that's quite uncommon i would say right like you know you you mentioned covid vaccines as a specific example right yeah. like we like you can go on like NCMSI, like the, you know, these net, these, these medical journals, yes. and you can look at the data yourself. You can see like, you know, we did a, like a, a, a controlled trial, including placebo, right? Like a, you know, a, a scientifically proven method of testing. Um, and you can see that this, um, you know, this vaccine has an efficacy rate of like say 95%, right? And, and from that, I would say, okay, you know, mathematically, my chances in Sweden at least are much higher of catching COVID than having any kind of problems related with the vaccine. So it makes mathematical sense for me. But the reason I think like this is because like, you know, I come from an educated family of scientists and I grew up, you know, in a, in a scientific, mm-hmm. scientifically stimulating world. And I work in a company that is very data oriented. So I, as a person, I look for truth in numbers. And but I, I think I that agree doesn't with that. apply to everybody. It, it, that's the problem. Like uh, I, I'm sort of the same, but I think it comes down to education, and no, but not everyone gets the same level of um, education or, or the same. Uh, people uh, have different interests. Like even if they have the same um, education and the same background, maybe they're just not interested enough to to care, and and that exactly. that creates a problem. <laughs> But I think it's more the people who intentionally spread misinformation, right? Who are so dedicated, like it's the people who care on the other side. If it, you know, yeah, those but, are big, you know, to, to play the devil's advocate, to play the devil's advocate. I think that also holds a place in society, right? Like I think if we were all like like me, like you know, number crunching robots, I don't know if if society would, you know. Like it's it's almost the fact that there are people who say weird things that make people question 
like you know the you need that interaction that they yes. in, right and 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 that in a way like it's it's kind of screwed up because it probably is wrong but the fact that you fact check yourself is super important right to to always know and have in your mind that you could be wrong is probably one of the most important learnings that we as humans can take absolutely no that when you say something or do something or think something you could be wrong right to be acceptant of the fact that you are not god 100 um, is, is very important right and and maybe for society as well to accept that but i think what we cannot accept is people who create hate and say things that have zero basis in any kind of scientific or factual kind of um, environment and, and and i think that's where we're seeing you know large companies like you know facebook and google and spotify start to intervene right and this is where you know i have to say i don't share the necessarily the opinions of my company here but we are doing work to prevent misinformation on spotify and there is a large team of people that does try to evaluate the things that people say on our platform you know is it free speech or is it misinformation and this line is really like it's a really fun one to play it's, it's blurry i can understand uh, misinformation is like um i think uh, there is benefit in like questioning everything because it helps growth uh, helps uh, to to solve problems helps to like find solutions but there are things that like we 100 percent sure that there are like wrong and i cannot find any justification in like i don't know uh why would anyone advocate for like um flat herters for instance like what's 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 the point that's just like spreading misinformation uh but like everyone knows and probably even they know like what what's the point of that so i think we can get very philosophical here which i'm more than happy to do but i think some of it comes into natural human psychology right like we find that there are many things that we don't have a lot of scientific evidence for in the world that people believe in in huge numbers right um and i think the psychological reasons why people do that are a little more complicated than just like the concept that people believe in themselves i think a lot of it centers around human psychology and our interest in being part of a group right so i think you know people who believe shall we say use you know, the flat earth example people yeah. who believe in this theory of flat earth they're usually doing it as you know i would postulate that they're doing it as part of a group of people who believe in flat earth oh yeah absolutely right right but it's it's maybe there are uh, you know quite a few people who are who just love the idea that earth is flat right cool but i i would postulate that a lot of people are doing this because they like to feel unique right we all want to feel different and special and holding a unique point of view whether it's correct or wrong does give you that feeling of being like you know i'm special i'm unique i'm different and you're part of a group of people who you also believe are special and unique and different and so in that you are you are you are kind of hitting a part of your brain that is hardwired from you know a long time ago to to feel unique and to feel special and to feel you know part of a collective right it's, it's that, kind of like um, the same you know way ancestral need to go like i told you so but in this case it's never going to happen but they like to be in the position that like i i might get to that point uh exactly like I, i hold some information that everyone disagrees with and if i happen to be proven right i can go i told you so so it gives like a sort of like power some feeling reward exactly i i think that's definitely true i mean we think think back to you know let's say you know the foundations of humanity people would group into tribes right and they would believe in a certain kind of shall we say religion or maybe you know a certain i don't know a culture right yeah. this is a thing that human beings like inherently have and this would be something that binds people together and we see this this community aspect in everywhere right you know like you know i i guess my friends here are you know we are bound together by a love of 
um, to say hiking or startups or I don't know, cryptocurrency, whatever. Like we find people who share similar values to us, but we don't necessarily do it just because of the values themselves, but more because it's creating a group, right? Like, I think you'll find that if you went to a flat earth meetup, it's not that people will be talking about flat earth the whole time. You know, a lot of people will be going to feel like them, they have friends, not necessarily because they care that much about the fact the earth is flat, you know, yeah. which doesn't really affect their day-to-day -day life. That That's my, that's my hypothesis, you know, and I have zero training whatsoever in any kind of, psychological <laughs> um, education no, but uh, you're onto something for sure i agree with that like that th there, there must be a reason why anyone would want to go against the the, the mass and what's um acknowledged acknowledged to be to be true mm. yeah i think we're going to see a lot more of this happen as well you know i think it's it's just part and parcel of having the internet to be very frank it's like now that everyone in the world can talk to each other, of course this is going to happen. I'm surprised it's not worse. Maybe it is worse and I just don't know it, you know? So what's the fact the... that everyone in the world can talk to each other is is always going to cause this kind of stuff. Oh, absolutely. And I think it's going to get even... even um, we're going to go deeper as soon as, like... Um, I don't know. I like to talk about this uh, Elon Musk uh, neural link uh, mm. project, even though I don't really know much about it because like it's it's super early stage uh, do you know anything about it yes um <laughs> i've actually researched it quite extensively i find the concept of a neural lace very interesting um i think it will be one of those things that supercharges humanity and causes a ridiculous amount of wealth disparity absolutely <laughs> like much more so than we see today um I guess, you know, for the listeners who, who aren't aware what Neuralink is, it's basically the idea that we have um, an el electronic connection between our brain and, you know, uh, a computer. That's probably the most simple way of putting it. Um, the neural lace is actually inserted inside your skull, most likely, because the quality of the, shall we say, the interaction between your brain and like an electronic device, if it's placed outside of your skull, like in, um, I think it's an EEG, right? Yeah. I think it's the, you know, you can wear a device that tries to read brain waves through your skull, but they're super low resolution because your skull is, you know, hard. <laughs> yeah. So um, the idea is basically we're, we're, we're implanting, um, a com you know, a, a connection to the brain inside the skull. Uh, the idea that the chip is also implanted inside the skull really doesn't resonate too well with me. I want to feel like I have like a, I can I can connect my you know my brain to the computer when I want to, right? And I think you know we're going to see this within our lifetimes for sure. They're doing it with pigs now. Yes. I think you know by the time that you know I'm fifty or sixty, this is probably going to be relatively common. Um, it's just that. For me, the ideal would be that the neural lace, you know, go ahead, you know, cut my skull up and implant it. That's fine. Maybe keyhole surgery, something, something. But then I want to have, like, maybe, you know, I don't know if you've seen the Matrix. Yeah, I was about like, to say, it reminds me of the very first you have, Matrix. You have, you have this, like, little plug in the back of your skull. And I suspect it'll be something like that, right? That is where, you know, that is where the actual interface happens. So the ability to communicate with your brain uh, having a brain computer interface will will exist but it's more like the the reader is only connected to computer when i want it to be right so i could theoretically take take the chip out if there's something wrong with it and, and that's kind of you know what i'm hoping they will try and do rather than uh, hope you know than, than making us actually have a computer permanently implanted in our brain which but, does make me nervous yeah i mean it, the whole thing is terrifying and, and also leads to the are we living in a simulation sort of enigma? Because, you know, if that is possible, think about the Matrix. Like, the, they have that uh, connection in their skull, in the back of the neck. But in the movie, the people who were born in the Matrix, they were connection free. Uh, so if something like that, what's the equivalent of something like that? It is 
basically those people were not able to see what was outside of the simulation meaning that you can go deeper and deeper in many levels uh which leads to the to the um, question like we might be in a simulation already and mm -hmm. there is no way That's of true. knowing that like we might be a product of a product of like some other superior level computer um it's very possible i i would i would say that the the randomness of society would require a re like to simulate everything in the universe that we have discovered would require a very 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 complicated computer yes yeah. but uh, if this has been happening course, for it's, millennia it's totally yeah if this has been happening for millennia then whoever originated this thing they might have the like beta exa whatever amount of uh energy and computing yeah. power to to yeah make that happen and i think that's just the product of the fact that we know that you know the universe is infinite right and and we cannot do anything about that um so yeah it's entirely possible living in a simulation to be frank it doesn't really i don't really care that much about it like <laughs> It doesn't, it's something interesting to think about, I guess, right? But whether we are or not, like it doesn't really change that much in, in my life, right? Like it's a, maybe I'm, you know, quite a, a practical kind of person, but for me, um, that, that question almost leads me more to like, what is my purpose in life, right? You yeah. know, if, if, if I'm in a simulation or if I'm not, the question is the same, you know, why do I exist? And the answer and is, is probably the I same. About every day. <laughs> and the answer is probably the same. So ultimately, it doesn't make any difference whatsoever. That is, I think, that is the answer that is the natural conclusion, but it's one that I really, really, really don't like. <laughs> I, I've been told like many to times, like, if we are in a simulation, and for us, there is no way of... Uh, going a level up like we're not going to be able to experience what's outside of the simulation then it doesn't make any difference whatsoever to us if we're in a simulation or not because this is everything that we can experience and to us there is basically nothing else um so yeah exactly it, th so it's terrifying really but <laughs> it, it's it's terrifying but i think it's for me it's it's actually not that terrifying because like I lead my life by this ethos that you should only really worry about the things that are kind of like in your control, right? That uh, That is a way to live a peaceful, productive life, in my opinion, you know? And this is something that's not in my control. But what is in my control is like, you know, the decisions I make every day in terms of, you know, what I do with my time, who I help in society, you know, where I give my money, you know, like what I buy, like to eat, like all these kinds of things. They are within my control, and those are the things I should be worrying about, right? Um, but obviously, it is nice to zoom out sometimes, right? I have this concept of like the micro and the macro. The micro being like the day to day stuff, you know, the day to day, like I was just saying, the decisions you make day to day. And then, if you only spend your time thinking about those, then you're missing out on like the philosophical part of life that is interesting, right? But I think it's finding a balance between the macro and the, the micro. Because if you spend too much time thinking in the macro, you're going to, you know, probably in your lifetime, miss out on so many beautiful things that kind of come from being in the moment, right? Absolutely. But if you only spend your time in the micro, then you're missing, like I was saying, out on like, you know, maybe even conceptualizing something entirely new, right? Like philosophers are probably the most under-resourced, uh, undervalued Kind of professions in my opinion because you know it, a lot of the time they're thinking about things that you know probably won't eventuate anything but then maybe you just have like a few different kind of thoughts that come about that change the way that you know we operate in society as a whole so you should a really tangent, but I, you should really have a look at the um, uh, podcast episode that i've done with uh, professor dean rickles uh he's um, a quantum physicist uh quantum physics expert and um he's uh, studies are funded with the goal of like him uh, researching 
the meaning of existence. And <laughs> it, it's really interesting, the chat that we had, and I, his approach is basically like um, a fusion of uh, physics and quantum physics and, 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 and philosophy. And that's, um, that's something that sort of defies old school science in a way. Um, I don't know. It was it was it was really brilliant to, to talk to the guy. Absolutely. I think yeah, that'll definitely I'll put that into like the macro bucket, you know. <laughs> like thinking, you know, finding time for that. Um, which is hard. I, I think, you know, imagine if we made sure that everyone like, you know, had time to think about the macro. You know, this this concept that I call like self actualization, right? <laughs> like in business school we studied this this idea of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Do you know what this yes. is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So like, you know, I guess I'm in this lucky position where I'm, you know, I have food, shelter, love, care, and all of the stuff that human beings need to start thinking about the big picture. And I think, imagine if we can get humanity to the point where everyone is thinking about these things and maybe doing it in a, in a connected way, right? You know, maybe coming back to your idea about Neuralink, right? Yeah. That's... If we could start having thought sharing, I think the the acceleration of human innovation is going to be ridiculous, not only from a technological perspective, but from a philosophical perspective. Absolutely. But if you think about it, like since the the origin of the internet and then Wi-Fi and then mobile phones, you can see like how exponential the growth of like humanity has been like in terms of like progress, technological, but also like solving global, global problem and global issues. Uh, if you think about just like 100 years ago or 200 years ago and everything that happened happened before that we we made as much progress in the last century if not like even more compared to like the previous i don't know 2000 years years of of, of history so once you advance and and this is because all of this technology helped us to connect and to interface each other. like it, it breaks the barrier between 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 uh, humans between people and, and it brings people together there are a lot of downsides the, yeah yeah absolutely the, there are side effects there are downsides uh facebook is not like the best thing in the world but has it's it's pros for sure and and it's not just facebook facebook is just like a trivial example um but once we have something like Neuralink in place to the point where it's not used just because the, the, the reason why they started is like to help people with disabilities to, to like move prosthetic limbs and stuff. But, but mm -hmm. the, the idea is that once you can control like a robotic arm, you can also control your cell phone with your brain. And then that's when you become um, telepathic basically because I why, yeah why why do you need a cell phone yeah at that point and, and, and eventually we, you get to the point where you bypass the, the cell phone because like your brain is the computer that interfaces with other brain computers through this like chip integration basically um which yeah. will happen like this like yeah. ramon this will happen like if we think about like the stuff we've talked about today like in terms of the universe being infinite and being in a simulation like because of this infinity, all of these technological innovations will happen if we can keep the planet from exploding in the meantime, <laughs> right? So this is the thing. It's like, you know, we are now in this, like, if we look at the curve, right, of human progression, it's looked like this, and now it's like this, right? It's like shooting straight up. Yes. But, and it will continue to shoot straight up, of course. But we, like, I think what everyone needs to recognize is that we need to, like, you know, in order to continue these progressions, right, we need to avoid dystopia. And and I don't know if people realize actually that, you know, that that is not impossible. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, if you, if you, and this is, and I hate to come back to this, I hate to be like a preacher, but people do not realize that like, we cannot have a, a telepathically connected society using, you know, brain computer interfaces. If the people, people are, you know, sweating. You know, we, oh, need to, yeah. we need to keep... It's kind of like if we treat the work, you know, if we treat the world as like a workplace environment, right? We need to make sure that everyone has, you know, snacks, they have water, they have like, you know, good temperature, all of this, like in order to be productive, right? If we think about, you know, society and, and the world as, as, a, as a job. If we don't have those things, people are not going to be productive. And, and like, we need to make sure that the office <laughs> remains 
productive. And that is where, like, I think maybe for the time being, we need to, you know, shift a few, you know, a lot more resources in the world now towards making sure that we can actually continue this sort of level of productivity and innovation that we have been. Because, you know, the reality is that it will probably start slowing down, actually, if we start seeing people, you know, if, if you're in, you know, near the equator, basically, you're, you're not going to worry about building startups or innovating, you're going to be worrying about like, not dying. Yeah, well, we need, we need to hope that we're like in a well, 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 the metaphor would be like we're we're a rocket and not an airplane because you know like if the curve is like this and then it goes straight up, you know what happens to like a, a, an airplane if they go straight up, they 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 stall and 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 fall. Yeah. So we we, we better hope that we're like more rocket like than airplane like because like think about um we might be not ready for something like that uh because of like how people think and 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 what their priorities are and and, and it connects back to what you were uh, saying before uh once we reach the level of the pyramid where everyone is going to be able to think about those major problems because all the primal needs are already satisfied that's when uh collective uh mind hive whatever you want to call it it's going to be effective otherwise it would be like giving uh, i don't know automatic guns to people in like the 300 uh, AD like like that will lead to like mass extinction of the human race like it th yes. there are reasons why cer certain things happen at certain times because like too soon or too late would be a total disaster but how do we it's know that sweet when spot yeah, 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 exactly. And uh, I think that's the that's the point we are at now is like, you know, we we are in our, you know, Ramon, in our lifetime, we're going to discover whether we're on the sweet spot or not. <laughs> uh, that's, yeah. that's, that's the crazy thing, you know, is that we are, I think, to be very frank, we are now in the most transformative period of human history. Um, you know, obviously we had ice ages right and, and all of this but that happened actually over a much shorter timeline for in one lifetime our lifetime you know uh, we're you know we're born in you know let's say the you know late 80s and 90s right we are going to see society either like become utopian or dystopian Absolutely. i think it will go either way in our lifetime to be to be really like freaking honest with you man because are, um... yeah yeah. Th th there are um, theories that claim that um, all of our technology comes from um, alien knowledge. And <laughs> there is, I know, I know, I know it's, um, it sounds silly and uh, it probably is total uh, nonsense. But think about if there was some. Um, alien uh, intelligence, uh, alien um, uh, minds who actually care for humanity in the sense that they, they don't want us to destroy ourselves. So they give us what we need when we are ready for it. And this reminds me a lot of really like people who believe in this kind of things. It reminds me a lot of like early days religion. Like we need to solve the problem of like understanding what we cannot understand, making up um stories basically. So like the idea of okay uh we're gonna get to a certain point of like evolution thanks to alien technology to me is the same of like oh uh there's some uh weird uh, lights in the sky it must be the gods throwing um uh, thunders or whatever they call like lightnings uh it, it's absolutely the, the same thing i think it is i think it's just the fact that human beings are always trying to explain what is happening around them they have to not they have to have an explanation you know, we are yeah. we never we cannot accept that we don't know like not knowing is just not an option for the more, most of us like we're always searching for an answer and we, often we don't we don't we don't necessarily care if the answer is true yeah. <laughs> we just want an answer 
Uh, so it's true. I mean, can alien technology. And we believe it to be true. We, we want to believe it to be true, even we, even if we're not um, certain. Right. But that that itself, that ability that we have in our brain to like believe in things that we don't know are true, is what allowed humanity to progress to this point. Right. Like for example, Spotify. It's not really. It's a concept. Right, like it's something that me and six thousand other people believe in, so it exists. But it's a construct, right? Like it, it's not that the company exists in itself; it is the byproduct of people believing in it. You're opening a Pandora's box here, like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this dude. I think we could talk for fifty years. <laughs> yes, yeah. Everything is a construct. Uh, people are amazing at make believe uh countries are constructs um politics are constructs religious uh, religions are constructs um, societies are, um c- companies a- everything is like the projection of ideas made reality through storytelling basically like that that's all it takes you need to tell a story in a way that people would believe and it becomes reality exactly and it's been like that for, for thousands of years you know um and it will probably continue to be like that it's just now being hyper accelerated and and you know I, i think that's actually you know we're almost at the most fundamental core of of everything that we talked about today is that humanity is now able to share stories with each other at a really really increased rate yes. and so now the human brain which is still at the evolutionary perspective of you know 200,000 years ago most likely is like what the hell is going on because never had we had so many stories to believe in <laughs> yeah. right and i think that's i i don't know it'll be interesting to see what happens to the human brain um from a physiological perspective over the next 100,000 years or or you know maybe even less who knows um because like how yeah like before it was like you know maybe someone came to your house and told you a story about you know uh i don't know a god and you were like cool like i haven't heard about anything else like this sounds good but now like i open my phone and i could believe 100 million different stories written by a billion different people so naturally <laughs> we're going to have chaos right? that's what's happening in society is that is chaos because do you are... find interesting that most stories that we hear uh through books or uh, movies eventually it, it, it might take like 10 years it might take 100 years eventually they sort of become reality and i wonder is like people creativity to feed uh minds like it, it's 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 like watching a sci-fi movie that gives inspiration to scientists to come up with ideas that eventually become reality or it's like some sort of like hidden secrets that open the way to like those thi- things already exist but humanity is not ready for it so telling a story that sounds like um ludicrous is a way to make people familiar with it and um acquainted mm-hmm. uh, 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 in a way that when that eventually becomes released yeah people are comfortable with it because like they already they are already familiar with it which way yeah i agree i mean i think we could probably see that like if you look back at stuff that was written in like the 20s and 30s you know 100 years ago it's not that like this concept of like the computer didn't exist like people were starting to think about this right like machines that could think yes this was like it was a concept that existed 100 years ago and so by the time it actually became real we were already comfortable with it same with a neural link right and yes. this brain computer interface we're talking about it already today so you know when it comes around to it people are like oh yeah i've been hearing about this for like 50 years now you know yeah and uh, like i agree with you 100% man like and and i think that's maybe why like we need to have people who dream right that's why we have you know science fiction writers probably contribute a lot more to society than we think because they they give people like far fetch dreams right <laughs> it, it's kind of you know I, i'm not going to i don't want to talk about my job more but that's also kind of my job a little bit right it's like it's my idea it's my my job to provide 
the big long-term vision for us to then make steps on. The thing that scares me most uh, is probably um, they, 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 there are scientists who are trying to solve the problem of death because in theory mm. death is nothing but a degenerative disease and in theory if you find the right um, way to work like it, g g it it's a matter of genes but basically it, it in theory can be cured as much as like cancer potentially can be cured eventually but if you cure death and humanity is still like Imagine like th there's a lot of like assholes around. Imagine a, a lot like millions of immortal assholes. That would be a problem. Like w you don't want to be in a world where like people don't die and they are like um yeah, pieces of shit. So what <laughs> I, I guess that's, that, that that's something that like humanity needs to achieve once as you said we reach the level of uh, self-awareness and consciousness where we are not at the individual level but at a collective level the the best version of, of what humanity can can be mm. yeah immortality <laughs> it's a it's a concept that i think will probably come into place slowly you know i think people will just live longer and longer and longer until you know maybe they won't want to live anymore. I think, I'm not sure. I mean, maybe if we become interplanetary, it will become more interesting. I'm not sure if you've um, seen the show Altered Carbon. I think it's quite an interesting show. No, not yet. Um, it's, it's like this concept, it's what you're saying. It's like theoretically, like people are storing their consciousness in like a computer so they can just move it between bodies. What's the um, name of the show again? I'm going to write it down. <laughs> Altered carbon, A L like altered A L T E R E D. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it would cause. I think it would happen very slowly, right? You would just have a few people that live forever who can afford it. I don't think it would become like something that is mass for a long time. Um, so it would just be like you would have a lot of disparity. You would have like wealthy people that live forever and poor people that don't. Um, and I think, you know, it, <laughs> I would like to think that people become less asshole as they get older because they, you know, theoretically learn more about the world and like, you know, they have experiences that lead them to what I think is the correct way of living, which is to be kind to others. It's hard to know what would actually happen. I mean, to be speculative, I think because of the disparity of it, as I was saying, you would have people who who probably, I think you would get bored, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, like, there, there is oh, a and I think it would change the, the human psyche a little bit because, you know, the fact bit. that I will die <laughs> is like bit. subconsciously driving me to do everything I do. Like I wake up and get out of my bed and go to work and like, part, you know, I, I party and I hike and I travel and I love and everything I do in life is because subconsciously i know that i don't have infinite time to do it yeah. it's kind of like when you're in your hometown you never really go and see the touristy stuff because like you kind of have you've got time to do it so why bother if people started living forever i think society would probably become very unproductive because they'd be like ah no, i what mean the fuck's the point yes but you want people to be to become immortal only when there is nothing to be achieved anymore <laughs> I think you'd, yeah, I think that would create a whole kind of mental health crisis that we cannot even imagine, right? Yeah, yeah, we're not um, even talking about like minds at that stage anymore or people. I think there's going to be like an extra level of it. As, as soon as you start implementing chips in people's um, brains, mm -hmm. you cannot call them like um, Homo sapiens anymore. I think like it, it's going to be like a different level of um, next step of evolution. I think they, I mean, that's what we're called now, right? We're like homo, homo sapiens, right? Homo we're like the next. Sapiens, sapiens. Uh, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So we're, we're the new, the new, new human. The new, new human. New I, human. I, I guess I would just encourage people now to, to really think critically in both the macro and the micro, right? Like as a summation, 
you know, thinking about like, you know, chips and brains and like AI and, and immortality should be done weekly. <laughs> it's almost meditative. But I would also encourage everyone to, to think about like the stuff that is probably going to hit them in the face in the next couple of years, um, which probably everyone is thinking about, um, but, but maybe not just your, your jobs and your, um, you know, your, what you're doing tomorrow. It's more like, you know, other decisions that I make day to day going to keep me alive in the next 50 years. I think that's something that people probably, we need to think a little bit more medium term, not today, not tomorrow, but like two to 10 years. That is where people, I think, not thinking very much right now. Yes, but uh, yes, no, I agree with that. Um, some people like, you know, there's a lot of um, people like to be, or people think that the healthiest thing to do is to live the moment and be present and focus only on the present. I think you need a fair balance of like mindfulness and all of that, but also perspective and like being able to see the bigger picture which comes with a burden which comes with responsibility and headache but it you need that otherwise like you're isolating yourself into this like capsule of like micro cosmos that like is ultimately meaningless agreed that's why you need like almost everything in life it's like a balance right yes and you need to like find a balance between the two and and that's what i try to do every day right is you know i will spend some time you know getting shit done and then i'm going to spend a bit of time thinking about my own existence because without i feel you of those, yeah like and and the, it's just that i think a lot of people are doing too much of probably the micro right that they're, they're thinking too much about yeah like you say their microcosm um which is bad. And, you know, I think conversely, there are also a lot of people who maybe spend too much time thinking about the big picture and then they don't really actually achieve anything in life. And that is also, a, in my mind, like not ideal, right? We want people to be contributing to the, to the goodness of an improvement of humanity as a whole. Absolutely. I really love this conversation and I think we didn't have enough time. I need to ask you to do it again at some point in the future. But for Absolutely, now, I love that. Uh, for now, I want to thank you very much for uh, join, joining me on this Zoom call. And uh, by all means, if you at some point happen to be back in uh, Sydney, we should um, catch up. 100%. Yeah, I'd love to be uh, sitting there in the chair in person rather than uh, virtually thousands of kilometers apart. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks everyone for uh, listening. And uh, good night. Thanks, Buona notte. Thank you, thank you.